we may not be able to get in on the sporting action like we used to, but we can get in on some exclusive offers from Renault. To celebrate their third year as official car partner of the GEA, Renault is offering a range of special offers exclusive to all GEA club members. So now you can take home the win right to your door. Check out Renault.ie forward slash GAA to find out more. With Renault, official car partner of the GAA, taking the passion of a nation to a whole new gear. A grain of rice. A grain of rice is going to tip the scale. Just remember that, then. And that small bit of a needle there. Now, come on, Mayo. You've got to get Andy Moran into the game. Listen between them, and now they're really roaring. And I can tell you, I'll tell you, there won't be a cold milk and cold declare for at least a week. By Sunday evening, almost half the counties of Ireland will be gone from the All Ireland Senior Football Championship. Will your county be one of them? Or is it one already? Hello, everyone. You're very welcome to the Renault Irish Examiner Gaelic Football Show. My name is Paul Rouse, and I'm joined by the former Armagh footballer, Oisín McConville, and by the former Dublin footballer, Mossy Quinn. Oisín, seven counties knocked out last Sunday, and not a shocking sight. Very unforgiving format, first and foremost, Paul. Uh, before we get on to the quality of the football, I mean, you think of... Uh, the effort that has gone in and you get one day, at least it was sunny, one day in the sun uh, and then all of a sudden you're gone. Um, for a lot of counties, it was an inevitability about what was going to happen. Uh, for others, I think there was that uh, glimmer of hope and shades of what went on seven months ago when, when Tipperary and Cavan uh, shocked us all. But it never felt as if it was a weekend like that. It never felt as if there was any major shocks you know i was at uh down donegal and I, I suppose you know i was very happy after 22 minutes it was seven five to, to donegal and in the next 15 minutes they just put the game to bed and uh i suppose really and truly uh, the big shock for me at the weekend was the level of the scoring so 323, 322, and 225 from the big boys. So Kerry, Mayo, uh, Donegal, that gives you an idea of where these teams are at. And I would say Donegal walked away from Newry thinking that was a mediocre enough performance. Uh, and that I think that tells you everything that it has to tell you. I think average first... winning an average winning margin across seven matches of almost 13 points. I know slightly skewed by the fact that Offaly won by nine points in extra time, but still almost 13 points uh, as an average winning margin in championship football. Yeah, and you know what? The game sort of reflected that as well. It's not as if, you know, it's it's something that, you know, you looked at over the weekend, you saw, like, I suppose, awfully loud um, as far as um, being close and exciting and all those things, you know, real sort of championship fair. Um, that was as good as, as they had to offer. But the go-to, Paul, uh, you know you're in trouble when the go-to after the first round of, of uh, championship fixtures is championship structures. I and mean, you know when people go there. Um, but I just think, like, for all of the championship structures and all that, like, we're talking about Clare. I'll just pick out Clare and I'll pick out down. Two Division Two teams. I mean, like, are we really talking about, you know, us having a Division One championship, a Division Two championship? Do you know what I mean? So... Uh, that was there was a real stark contrast uh, in the levels of performance of Down and Donegal last week, and Clare and Kerry in particular. And uh, and if we were to split up the championship in the way that we think we're splitting them up, those two teams are still going to be in the same competition next year. And uh, what are we going to have? Do you think you know there's going to be a massive turnaround? You know, like I talked to Down people, you know, after the game on the way out, like and they want Paddy Tally out, they want. You know, they want changes. As, I don't think anybody's going to come in and, and do anything. Were the, best, were the best footballers in down on no. the field? No. Why? Uh, I don't think they think it's attractive enough to play for down. I think they feel there's a sort of a defeatist attitude there. They think um, that there's no real um, capacity to win anything. 
And uh, and I think there's those players have folded it. Yeah, they have a couple of injuries, a couple of the significant ones. Don't know how probably the most significant. Um, somebody who would commit, but there's 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 players all over down who are good enough. Like, I mean, Jerome Johnson was the best player last year as far as for, the forward division. You remember what he did to Cavan for 35 minutes. Um, his brother Ryan, do you know what I mean? There's a cohort of Brannigans, there's five Brannigan brothers, there's definitely three of them fit enough to play. You know, that's only the Cuckoo lads I'm covering. And there's there's more than just the Cuckoo lads. I know there's an issue around Cuckoo and why they won't commit, uh, something around, you know, Paddy Tally and whether there's a disagreement there or not. But uh, certainly that's the first thing. I think as any team, we maybe discussed this before. I think as a manager, uh, your first trick, like for example, um, a lot of people question, you know, the Mickey Hart to Loud thing. One thing Mickey Hart has done since he went into Loud is he's had the, all of the best players available to him. So, you know, it's whipped up a bit of enthusiasm. Uh, it's changed the fortunes in that they've, they've, they've gained promotion. So maybe job done as far as that's concerned. Um, but if you're trying to play your trade slightly above that, Division 2, and you don't have your best players... It's a very, very unforgiving place, and and really for those down players last, like I really felt for the likes of uh, Darren and Barry O'Hagan last week. Yeah, uh, you know what I mean. Like, like I I talked that uh, after the match about. Remember, we talked a couple of weeks ago about Killian O'Connor and his responsibilities as far as defensive duties is concerned. David Clifford doesn't have those. Uh, Dean Rock doesn't have those. Um, and Barry O'Hagan last week was expected to be in his old full, full back lane uh, or half back lane, turn the ball over, help him to turn the ball over, get bodies back in, get numbers back in. And he's also expected to be the main man to go up front. That, that, and he was unbelievable. He scored eight points, but, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's just, as I say, it's, it's very, very unforgiving. And, you know, for the last, what? Effectively, from half time on, I mean, like the game was done and dusted, and you know you've 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 twenty down players who played in the second half at different stages, um, just trying to play for a little bit of pride, and and they were getting absolutely destroyed all over the field, really and truly. Really. Massey, what did you think of Donegal? Yeah, I, I was impressed with them um, in the sense that it was very much a case of job done. What jumped out of me again was probably the score they put up. They've, they've, in previous years, might have come through games like that and won it, but they might have scored one thirteen, one four. You know, they've always done enough to win. Whereas when you're when you're getting into that, like you're getting close to thirty points, never mind twenty points, and what they did at the weekend. So that 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 to me was probably something slightly different. Um, and without going down the rabbit hole of the championship structures, and and it is unfortunate that after the first weekend of the championship, that's what you go back to. You have to ask. And there might be specific reasons why some down players aren't committing, but are we doing enough for players? And if we do tier the championship or whatever it is, ideally you're only giving guys more games. You're making it more attractive for the players to commit because if you're coming out of a lockdown period as we were in April or May and guys are going, is it worth giving my time to, have, you know, can we do this or is it worth doing? And I think that's where going forward there obviously has to be a look at in terms of making sure you're maximising the opportunities for players to play regular games and it comes back everyone talks about it playing the league is a great competition because they're playing at the same level and to try and bring that into championship so a down player or any other player isn't looking going geez we've one day against we've one day against Donegal and realistically that's 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 the height of it for us for the summer you know so um but yeah the, the game itself yeah, what impressed me, what I took from Donegal as well, is the spread of scores. Um, obviously, Michael Murphy went off with the, with the nick, and while McBrearty kind of is the main man shooting up there, they still have, they've still got a lot of lot of other options coming in and chipping in, and you see Jamie Brennan and um, Kieran Thompson and Langan, and they, they have a lot of talent coming through there. I like them. I like the look of them. They've been building quite building for the last couple of years, and I think, obviously, they're getting to the stage where they're going to have to really deliver, and um, yeah, I think they're going to be a tough out for anyone this year. It, it it's it's hard to see Donegal winning anything though without Paddy McBrearty having an exceptional season. Did what sort of form did he show on Sunday uh, at the uh, against Down? Uh, I think he made one. Paddy McBrearty is liable, especially in Ulster, when when you know when it starts, he he wants to be the man to shoot the lights out early. Uh, I think that happened once in the first half, and he got a. He got he got a very obvious and uh, and talent um, contribution from the Murfern and uh, they had a bit of a set too and uh, there was words exchanged and that he didn't do that anymore 
Uh, he, t- he took a, a shot he, in the first half. He was moving to his left, running away from the goals. Very difficult uh, opportunity. Um, but after that, he played uh, very sensible football and he brought other people into the game. And when he does that, when he does that, just that one thing, uh, then he it opens up a whole pile of room for himself. Uh, but he's going to face tougher defences than he faced the weekend. But I'd say he's in as good a form as he ever has been, to be honest. Massey, yeah. do you see them as genuine contenders? I do, yeah. Obviously, Ulster is the toughest province to come out of, so they're going to have their work cut out to kind of come out of that. But um, yeah, I do. I, I think that it looks like they have the strength and depth. And they've, again, and it's probably consistent with, with the way football's gone. We've talked about the scores and they're not as focused on their defence as, as they seem to be. And they do have that ability to get scores and, and the threat. And they've paced, they've paced at different lines. They've ball winners at different lines. And um yeah, so they are genuine contenders, but like again, they have to get they have to get out of Ulster. Like they obviously have big games coming up there, and you know, while Tr- uh, Tyrone might be in transition and Armagh are coming, so they are the favourite team. But I still think I still think they'll have their work to do to get out of Ulster. Are you I nervous? Reco- I, thought, I thought the recovery. Sorry, just on Donegal. I thought the recovery after Murphy, you know, exited the scene. You know, you, you think you know, there's still going to be question marks now, but. Uh, it's almost like they expected it that you know they just got on with it, and I suppose those couple of games that they played against um, uh, Armand, not Throne, who's the other one, uh, Monaghan, you know, without him has definitely helped them. So uh, I think they they seem to take the younger lads seem to take on that added bit of responsibility. So um, I think it, it worked quite well for them at the weekend, and also this is the first year they haven't tipped them to to be major <laughs> contenders. So. That's obviously a weight that is uh, off their shoulders. Which is I'd, I'd say they, they, that that's probably part of the motivational speeches. That this is, <laughs> this is opening up for us here. Nervous about Kerry Massey? Um, yeah, you, look, you'd have to be. Like in terms of the form they've shown, like they've been consistent here in the league, and they brought that into the championship again. And to me, they, they look like a more settled team this year in terms of the last year. The court game was very um, again. People call it a once off, or whatever. But even they just. They were unsure of themselves. It looked like they were playing within themselves. They, they weren't really sure of the system. They probably weren't comfortable with it. Whereas this year, since they've come back, there's been a real intent in all their performances. They're obviously putting up big scores. They, they seem a little bit more the structure up front, while Clifford and Sean O'Shea might be the kind of standout guys. They're getting a big contribution from everyone else around them. Um, they will have question mark Like the way they're going, it's set up for them to do similar to Tipperary, what they did to Clare. And then whoever comes out of the other side, you'd imagine, they'll get the job done in the Leinster final, but or excuse me, in a, in a Munster final. But um, they've question marks over their goalkeeper. Um, I know Shane Ryan was, has been carrying an injury, but even at the weekend there, um, sort of goalkeeper. And then you still go back to the Dublin league game against them down in Turles and the ease at which Dublin created and scored goal opportunities against them. So, But they are set up more where if it is, does turn out that it's a Dublin carry game, it feels like it could be more like a 2013 game where it was more a shootout, more end to end, more kind of coming down to the last five minutes, kind of whoever has the ball last coming towards the end could be the ones um, pushing on rather than anything we've seen cager affairs in previous years. Um, but yeah, in terms of the score and the balance within the team, I think they're far stronger and even a bit of strength and depth as well. Like Paul Murphy didn't play at the weekend as well. Um, so yeah, no, you'd be, of all the teams since they've come back, they've been far and away the most impressive. John O'Shea at full forward. Was that what did you think of him in there? Yeah, I, I like it. Like, like Sean's obviously a, he's an exceptional talent, but I like the fact that they're willing to, to kind of mix it up a little bit. And it also puts if you're preparing for Kerry and similar to what Dublin do with Kieran Kilkenny and Con O'Callaghan, like Con might come out wearing eleven some days and you feature inside. But if you if you're going out to try and match up, not that they were getting Previously, you could have said, well, Sean O'Shea's nearly played every minute at centre forward. So you're kind of, if you're going out with a defensive game plan, you're able to turn around the plan and say, right, well, that's where he's going to be. So here's our plan for him. Whereas if they push him inside, does that change your matchup inside? It starts asking defenders different questions and it allows them to play. And even the role Paddy Clifford is playing in terms of he's dropping deep, he's getting on ball, he's linking play a little bit more. So it might free Sean up to be a little bit more uh, forward thinking in terms of being more direct going at goal. So um, I like it. I think it, it just adds another and that adds another dimension to them. Um, whereas it seemed like last year, was everything was like, right, get the ball and try and get it into Clifford and see what happens, see what comes off. Whereas they're a lot more balanced this year. So um, I think it'll stand to them. 
O'Sheen, Jim McGuinness said in the course of the match, and I'm going to paraphrase here, that uh, Kerry's kick-out strategies were not of a level good enough to win in All-Ireland. Yeah, when I seen them against Tyrone, I was actually, that was one of the things I was actually impressed with, was uh, how quickly they were able to get the, the ball away. And uh, what I liked about them, uh, any manager out there probably hopefully will agree, is that they weren't too short. So they weren't, um, they weren't, uh, they weren't putting themselves under pressure. And I think, uh, you know, Mossy touched on the fact that he's a fairly new goalkeeper to the scene. And uh, I think because of that, they've made things maybe simple as, as possible for him. Uh, get him into it, you know, uh, get a championship match under his belt. And I think uh, they will probably advance it from that. Plus the fact, do they really need to show us anything at this stage? They're going to need to show us anything through Monster. I mean, I imagine there's there's bound to be a bit of keeping the powder dry for, for, for later in the year. Is that what teams do? Is that what county teams do at this stage when they're fairly confident that they're going to win? That Do they do two things? Do they keep their powder dry and not display certain moves that they may have? And number one, and number two, do they seek mixed misdirection, as in putting Sean O'Shea full forward when you know he's most likely going to play centre forward when it comes down to it? Is that is that part of the is that part of the long game that's going on here? I, I think I think it depends on where the team is and their kind of evolution of uh, how experienced they are, where they've gotten previous years. I, I don't know that Kerry. While they might hold one or two things back, to me it looks like Kerry this year have gone hell for leather in every game. They're going out. They're trying to they're trying to get that consistency and trying to kind of for, make sure that they're gonna not going to deliver a performance like they did last year. So I, I don't know that they'll they'll. They'll continue to work and try and continue. So kick out's a perfect area. Yes, if, if you have a young goalie coming in and it's his first or second start, you're going to simplify it a little bit to try and take the pressure off him. Or you might allow him to go longer as well at times where if he does lose it, he's losing a 50 yards from goal and the, the instant pressure isn't coming back on him. So you definitely would in certain areas. But I think like that up front, I think they've been going... Like I don't know that you'll see anything drastically different. They like the way Paddy Clifford is dropping deep. Yeah, they might mix up Sean O'Shea going in and out, but I don't think that's a drastic tactical change. And um, I think they're certainly at a stage where they're trying to just they're trying to even reinforce within their own heads. Can we do this in games? So that was what the Sean O'Shea one was about. Whereas I think if teams are a little bit more experienced and they've a little bit like you can you can. Donegal perhaps could do something with Michael Murphy, although he's played everywhere over the course of the last few years. But you could do something with the players a little bit more experienced and you could say, right, we might show a little bit because that won't possibly take as long or won't take as, as much to implement. Whereas I do think it depends on, on where the team is at. If we turn to the third contender for Ultimate Honours who are out of the weekend, Mayo, since we did our last podcast, Oshin, Killian O'Connor, news came out that Killian O'Connor is gone for the rest of the season with an Achilles injury, or at least that's what the word is at the moment. Can you see Mayo winning in All-Ireland without Killian O'Connor? Mm. I can still see, uh, in my book, until things change and what I've seen this year, I still think Mayo are, are the second best team in the country. Um, and I think um, Killian O'Connor will be ex- a significant miss but I think that Mayo have done something the last two years almost in a, in preparation for what has happened. <clears throat> and I'm sure, pretty sure that they didn't foresee it in that they've used 38 players. Um, a lot of those lads have got an opportunity up front. We've seen new lads last weekend. Um, and, uh, you know, above anybody, I think they're as prepared as, as they possibly could be for every, every eventuality. Um, I think... Uh, again, it gives the opportunity for some of these, uh, some of the big players to stand up. I think last week was as mobile and as direct and as as well as Aidan O'Shea has has been for me in in some time. Um, but I think uh, it's hard to see Mayo winning All Ireland anyway because the dubs are lo- looming large. But I think um, for me, Mayo is still the second best team until Kerry. Prove me, improve it. Otherwise, Massey. Yeah, it, it it is hard to see them. Like as in, he, he's so critical to them. He does such a huge amount of scoring. I think stack came out last year. He scored was five forty of their eight eighty. I think it was or something ridiculous. You know. Now, the one thing I would say to that is, 
obviously then there's an opportunity for other guys to come in and step up. And when you come in playing county, like you, you're probably most of these guys are the main man for their club team and they're used to getting a high volume of possession and they're used to being a lot with filter children for club teams, particularly forwards. They might take more frees, they might take more shots. Whereas if you come in, guys, young guys that have come into that team in the last year or two, Killian's getting the majority of possessions in that forward line. So you then might have to go from playing your regular game where you're getting a high volume of possessions to now you have to be much more efficient. You might only get a quarter or a half of the same amount of possessions. And it's harder sometimes to make a make a breakthrough or make an impact. And in fairness, Tommy Conroy's come in and done a really good job with that the last year or two. But it now frees up someone else to kind of come in and, and it gives them, maybe they'll kind of grow into that role in terms of more pressure. And if you have an elite level free taker, maybe his frees aren't missed as much. So, so I don't know that the gap is that significant, that he's an exceptional player, but I don't know that we won't see someone come in and take an opportunity that that might, mightn't have got it otherwise because a lot of the ball would have been going to Killian anyway. So um, I'd imagine that's the way James and the Mayo management are looking at it and, and any of the guys in there are going to put their hand up. So um, that's something to look for. And again, the fact that the way Connick's going, they might get games where before they potentially get to a Dublin, they might have a couple of games to work on that as well and to kind of to grow into it a little bit before they have to go out and mark a, a Mick Fitzsimons or someone like that, you know. So um, that's something to keep an eye on in terms of who comes in and who's, who kind of steps into his place. Did you find that when you moved from club football to county football, going from being the main man in Vincent's into one of a group of players who were used to that position, did you find that transition difficult? Uh, yeah, I would have, yeah, because it's definitely something you you know, because and like I would have been, I suppose, a free taker as well. You're you're getting a lot lot of shots from open play or or more so from dead ball. So when you go into a squad and if you're not going onto a pitch as the primary free taker, you're maybe you'd be used to getting a rhythm of scoring or you get an early free and you think, right, I'm in the game and it helps you. And then then from open play, you might feel a little bit more confident. And uh, yeah, there were certainly times that you, and then you sometimes you can start putting yourself under a bit more pressure. If you're getting less possession, then you think, oh, let's do something here. And maybe laying the ball off is the right thing to do, but you dummy to someone and you turn and take a bad shot. And all of a sudden you're putting yourself under more pressure. Whereas when you know you're going to get another five or six possessions in the next couple of minutes or, you know, over the course of a half, it's easier to lay the ball off a little bit, you know. So um, I definitely think that's something players, it takes a bit of getting used to, particularly for inside guys, if, if, if what you view as your main role in the team is scoring and, and that's how you think you're going to contribute to the team, it can, be, it, can be, it can be a challenge for guys to come in and not be the main, main player in terms of the, the focal point of the attack. And then with misses, so if you were taking freeze for St. Vincent's, it would be a fairly brave individual who would try and take the ball off you, even if you'd missed a couple. Did you feel that same sense of security when you were taking freeze for Dublin? Yeah, well, I, I had Dermot with me with Vincent, so Dermot wouldn't be long telling you that. It's, <laughs> okay, uh, that's a fair yeah, point. It's, that's it's a fair point. Yeah, so um, Dermot had told me, he, like, you go training, and I'd be, like, for me to be a free taker, I had to practice all the time. And uh, Dermot would come out, and I'd be practicing, and he'd throw a ball down and kick the free over with his left foot and run, over, la- run off laughing, you know? So I'm <laughs> left going, I'm here for 40 minutes trying to get better. And he, you now, uh, so, yeah, but... Would you feel the pressure? Certainly, I suppose when I was taking freeze with Vince, or excuse me, with Dublin during the mid two thousands, Mark Vaughan was there. Mark was an exceptional dead ball kicker as well. So for a lot of the time, for those couple of years, you kind of knew that um, if I was starting, you had to produce obviously from freeze and then from play because Mark was obviously a very very capable replacement. So um, you certainly would have been aware of it, yeah. More so with more so with Dublin than with Vince, yeah. Oshin. The game between Mayo and Sligo, by the 24th minute, Mayo were 13 points ahead and the game was basically over at, at, at that stage. Have you been ever, have you ever been in a position like that in, in a match for either club or county? Well, I think anybody who's played Gaelic football has, has been in some sort of similar position. Um, what did uh, you do? What do you do? What do you do when you're like? There's basically more than fifty minutes of football there left when you take injury time and all that. What do you do in that situation? There's, there's well, if you have if it's a club match, then <clears throat> you try and get a taxi. You try and bring a taxi. If it's the, <laughs> if it's an in, inter county game, then you just you're just praying that the game that the game just be over and. I always have said before about referees, I'd be quite critical of referees. You probably wouldn't know that, but I've been I've been quite critical of referees. And uh, the referee that really annoys me most is the one there's eighteen points in it, and he puts up six minutes of extra time, and that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's just that just adds to the cruelty of it. But uh, there's nothing you can do. 
there's nothing you can do. And you know what? It's even more frustrating if you're a full forward. Like, you know what I mean? If you're in the full forward lane, you're just watching the whole thing. You normally get taken off if the team's losing by yeah, that much. You know, normally the first one to go. First one goes is 15. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's very frustrating. Uh, 2006, Kerry, we were actually a point up against Kerry, I think, at half time, And by the time the 50th minute of the game, I think we were 11 down or something. So, uh, and that was just one game where I just knew it just, just completely gone from us and we just didn't have anything else to give. What and did you do? Just, what did you do? Just, what were you thinking? I was just thinking, let's just see this out for what it is and and get home and start getting in the, the club frame. I mean, he's already, I already, by the time I was uh, changed and dressed, I was already in, in club mode. Couldn't wait to get my tracks it off and get get going because you want to rectify your rap, the, what's going on and you know you got, if, with in a, in in the county scene you there's the, there's a good possibility you're going to have to wait six eight months in order to get you know rectifying that whereas you know you just want to get back in the bike and get back in the bike with the with the club so uh, that was sort of my my instinct was to think you know how can I get onto the pitch and and get myself one six or one seven again, and, and realize that I actually can play football, you know. So uh, that was just that was just a big part of it. But it's nothing you can do. Nothing you can do. Just were you ever were you ever in a match in a situation like that where 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 players down tools, certain players you played with down tools? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think you, I might even have been one of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I remember I remember in a club match one time as well. We were getting beat by ten and. Uh, uh, I was just I got particularly ratty and I was just going around kicking and punching and doing whatever like and that was probably my early years and sort of you get home and you, you hear about it and and you learn from that and you just you just realize when the games sometimes when the game's up it's up you know but uh look at it, it's it's a, it's a very frustrating thing to be happening to you you know there's an overriding feeling of embarrassment uh which is which is part of it as well but Look, you try and stay in the game as, as long as you can, but we, look, you know what? Fairly sensible human beings will realize that you're not going to bridge the gap. You know, we were playing Kerry and not there in quarter final. We weren't going to come back from 13 and 14 points down. It just wasn't going to happen. One of the most, yeah, similar to Ocean, you just got to suck it up. Um, I would have played with guys who you see them getting taken, the red miss coming, and they're getting, they're just, they're going to lash out. And that, was, that wasn't me, but. Um, there's nothing more demoralising than being in the dressing room or someone saying, come on, we'll win the second half or something like that, you know, and you hear that and it's, uh, yeah, but th- again, there's not a lot you can do. You just got to, um, I do remember we were playing a club championship game here a couple of years ago and we were we were chasing the game the whole way through and we were we were losing and, and there was definitely, you're, you're kind of running around, and I, you'd like to think you try and keep going to the very end and you keep going and the team we were playing, they were kind of, I won't say goldness a little bit, but there was right coming towards the end. There were four or five points up last minute. More, probably seven or eight points up. And the ball was going over the end line. I tried to chase it to keep it in. And I managed to keep it in and basically fell over on my arse. And he picked up the ball and cleared it. And he had a bit of a laugh at me. And I remember I lectured. I basically told him to win with class. And I was like a school teacher giving out some. Yeah, as yeah. I was wa- and as I was walking off the pitch, I'm like, oh, you've turned into the cranky elf. Like, you know, that's like, yeah. I told, like, and that's all I could do. I give out to him. And uh, I was like, you know, you should, sh- sh- you know, have some pride, win with class. And I remember thinking to myself, going, you're not in a position to lecture anyone here. You need, to just, <laughs> you need to just be quiet and shake hands and walk off at the end, you know. So, but I was, that was my way of dealing with just. I was thick, you know. So, um, yeah, but there's nothing you can do, and you, you just hope the, the way it isn't that long. Like Ocean said, Ocean said, sometimes losing with the county, the best thing is to get straight back in with the club. Whereas when it finishes with the club, um, it can be very tough if you've a long wait then, or you've a couple of months, or you think it's, um, yeah, that, that's the hardest one to deal with. What about this thing of winning with class, though? Have you been in a side where you've been winning by so much, and how do you how do you keep going? At that as well do you actually try and were the teams that you were involved in did you set out to absolutely dismantle an opposition then when you had them when you had them down uh yeah i don't know if we set out to dismantle I mean, you obviously go out to try and perform to your best and if you're winning comfortably like there was probably a famous one in the mid 2000s where we were beating leash quite comfortably um, we did a couple of re- like Leash had beaten us in 2003 we beat them in 5 and 6 and I think it might have been 7 and coming towards the end of the game I think it was Alan Brogan or was it Mark Vaughan I think maybe we were pointing at the scoreboard and we were winning by 
20 odd points and I know I think it was Darren Rune who was playing full back for Leash and like, he would have eaten the two lads if he, yeah, yeah. If he went at them you know but, like, they were, yeah. yeah they were like they were brave like they were pointing up and waving at him and, and it, it was commented on in our dressing room like it was I know we got a bit of stick for it in the media after and it was that was probably around the time we were being like the nice lads and the nice team and we'd been bullied by Tyrone a little bit and we probably felt this was something we needed to do but I don't think it was natural to most of our characters it wasn't something that actually when you look back in hindsight, you say, look, it was the wrong thing to do. But at that stage, you're in it. And it felt like that's what teams were doing to us. And it felt like this is what we were experiencing and we should do it. But um, yeah, no. I don't, at I don't, that I time, was that the period when you used to walk down to the hill holding hands? Yeah, it's something, not holding hands, but yeah, we weren't far Link, off. It, Lincoln. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it would have been around that. So again, that that, was, that fed into like all that, type, that time where... Um, like even when we went up to play Tyrone in the first league in 2006, the Battle of Alma, like like yeah. we went into that game where like we'd lost the replay to them in quarter final in 2005, and like but they would have had Ricey and Connor Gormley and like guys wishing it know well, and like they were like it, it was an eye opener for us. Like we were struggling, like let win and that year was huge. Perfect hosts, from, really. To yeah, uh, like, like, you. like like we like we went from like you go from Mark and like. Joe Higgins for Leash and like guys who are and like they go out and play football and you shake hands and you think it's going to be the same and it's just not you know and we probably and and again around the time you're looking at what other teams are doing and sport is very much copycat by nature anyway well, what did they do and they want it and what can we do from them and you, you kind of think that maybe that you need to start doing it but um, yeah I, I do think you can win with class I think it's how you how you carry yourself and how if you are in a situation like that that you're not um, yeah in terms of Joe Higgins, Joe Higgins from Leash was a great footballer. I played on him in a club match once. Well, I played on him in the sense that we lined out beside each other. <laughs> and I, think, I think I saw him late in the game. Afterwards, it was a fairly distressing experience. Ushin, you're a, you're a long way up in the match. What happens? I'll try and see it out as best as possible. We always used to say, you know, the best compliment we can give the opposition is just keep playing the end. And we were involved in a lot of missed matches, I suppose, as far as early rounds of club championship and RMI were concerned. And we just tried to get whatever we could out of it, uh, you know, because, you know, that was our training session for that day and we weren't going to waste it as such. So uh, we would have seen it as the best um, best compliment we could give the opposition was to keep going, keep keep getting dug in, you know. And if you were well up in a game, would you, would you have not gone for goal and clipped the point? Like, would you have ever got to that if a goal was on, you were going for goal, even if you were 15 yeah, points up? Personally, uh, definitely not. Um, but no, no, we, we, we would have had certain targets, you know, yourself when you go in yeah. at half time and you're, and you're winning comfortably and, uh, you know, we say, listen, lads, let's kick 10 points, you know, in the second half. So we make sure you kick your 10 points and then, you know, just, just try and add to it as best you can. But as I say, that's the way we used to think about it in our heads was that, um, the best compliment we can give them is to, is to keep going. This weekend, let's turn to this weekend. Dublin make their their seasonal debut in the championship. Mossy, Dublin have managed to survive the loss of a lot of brilliant footballers in, in recent years. Paul Mannion, gone now. Jack McCafferty, gone. Dear McConnelly, gone. And now Keane O'Sullivan. They, they've all gone, but Dublin keep winning. Why is that? Still the depth of player that they have in the dressing room is still... Uh, to the level it is and the guys you've all named I suppose Jack and Paul are different because they've they've left kind of white choice in the sense of in their in their what people consider a prime or in their mid-20s rather than whereas like you think Keno Sullivan uh, Paddy Andrews Mick McCauley Dermot uh, Paul Flynn Bernard a lot of these guys had kind of filtered to the end of their career where they weren't starting they weren't as integral as they as they had been previously Keane is probably a little bit different. Keane, Keane O'Sullivan, without question, one of the best players I ever played with. Um, and only his body has given up on him, I would still say he'd have a role to play for for um, for Dublin. Um, Did you mark I, him in club matches? Did he pick you up when you when you played Kilmico Crokes? Sometimes, yeah. But like Keane, Keane could play, like Keane had the speed. Keane, Keane, like Keane won an All-Ireland at four as a man-marking cornerback. He was good enough to do that. He was good enough to play as a traditional six. And then he obviously brought the kind of plus one sweeper to an absolute different level as well. But any way you wanted Keane to do it, like he, he could go and wipe someone out. Like I remember 
Gooch gave Jair an awful tough time in 2013 for our staff and they moved Keane on to him in the second half and he, he negated him fully. But in terms of, like, he made a massive difference there. So Keane had that skill set and his reading of the game and just his speed, like, he killed, like, as in... My, I would rely on my own person. You're, you're relying on your movement and your, your kind of positioning to get possession rather than blistering pace. But Keane Keen had that and he had speed to go with it, you know. So um, the one thing you are starting to see, which would be interesting if there's a difference, like Paddy's gone from the dressing room this year, Mick McCauley, Keane. Like there's a high football IQ there with those guys. So even in terms of preparation, while they might have the same impact on the pitch uh, in terms of the game planning and the meetings and the, um, that side of things, there'll obviously be a loss there. But um, the reason they've continued to at the level they've had is because you've guys like Brian Howard or Owen Merchant or guys who are coming through and are, are kind of filling in for these guys and they've built up on that experience. Who, who is the best of the Dublin defenders that you've marked in club football? Um, the best of the guys that are there is Mick Fitzsimons. Now, I haven't marked him a huge amount in club football. I actually marked him he, when UCD were still in the championship. We played because uh, he's with Cool and Cool have been Division Two Dublin championship for the last number of years. But um, I would have marked Mick an awful lot. And, and and the reason Mick is as good as he is is he's comfortable being a cornerback. Like he wants to be a cornerback. He's happy to go out and play and stop someone else playing. And they're the worst cornerbacks to mark. They're the guys like. He'd love marking a cornerback who fancies himself as a wing back or thinks he's too much football to play cornerback. And and that was like you could spend an hour talking about the differences between the Dublin teams at the kind of late 2000s and, and when Pat came in. And but one of the big differences was like we had we had cornerbacks like Davy Henry and Paul Griffin and sure Barry Cal played in the full back line, Dennis Bassett, Ross McConnell, guys who didn't want to play in there or who are better served out the pitch. But then when you start bringing in Mick Fitzsimons, Rory O'Carroll, Keen O'Sullivan. Guys who are defenders, like at heart, they know they're defenders and they've no issue. They don't have they don't have notions, I think. And Mick doesn't think he's going to go out and score two or three points from being back. So um, so guys like that who are just who are who are primed to just stop opposition forwards. Davy Byrne has kind of come in and done that in the last couple of years as well. So um, but uh, club wise, I probably would have went up against Philly the most because we had a pretty good rivalry with Ballymun going there for five or six years, and Philly would have been the guy I would have marked quite a bit in club games. And um, so I would have gone against him more. But I just think how did that go? Fun. How did that go? Yeah, it was, it was, it was it. Like Philly's pretty, Philly's tough, and Philly's. But again, Philly probably fancies himself as not a cornerback. He's he thinks he's more football than being a cornerback. He did stints with centre back and centre forward with Ballymun, and um, so from that sense, I didn't mind marking him because you always felt you. He, he was going to go forward a little bit more and um, he didn't really want to spend the whole game just tracking a, a corner forward, you know. So, um, but again, very tough. And when he's in one-on-one and uh, it's physical and but I didn't mind. I enjoyed it. Like, I love competing. Sometimes when you go out, you want to mark the best cornerbacks. Like, you're nearly looking. If, if, if the best man marker goes to someone else, you're nearly kind of going, hang on, he's going over there. Where, like, who's, you know, so a little bit of the, the ego goes with it as well. So when you're going out against teams, you nearly want the best player to come over to you and see how you go against them. So, Ma- Mossy, Mossy, why are those why are those boys effectively gone out of the game? But the majority of them, you know, like when that, when when we played, I always would have thought there was two or three of those guys hanging around. Uh, now they're f- very few and far between. Out and out man markers, just willing to sacrifice their game. Yeah, it's a good question. I, don't, I, I honestly don't know. And it's probably an area, if you look at the strength and depth of the Dublin squad and other squads around the place, and maybe that's why teams are going to a more attack and more. The blanket is going to be, the blanket defence was obviously covering for a lot of people. So maybe the, the, the need to have a really good one-on-one defender or someone generally in the last couple of years, a lot of teams are playing that plus one or playing someone back. So you didn't really have that need to get out and win that primary possession because you could nearly let the guy win it and the plus one would come across or the sweeper come across. So maybe the system is kind of t- as d- as detailed it like that a little bit, but um, there's definitely less of them around. And that's why I think when you look at them, as you get down the line and if you start looking at the Mayos and the Donegals and the Kerrys and the Dublins, like if it turns into a shootout, eventually some defence is going to have to stand up and make a play. And that's why I think Dublin in, in recent years, the likes of Mick Fitz has stood up in big games. Uh, Davy Burns had a couple of really big games in in like latter stages of championships. And I think that, that they've stood to them, you know. So, um, But yeah, there, there definitely is less and less guys. Even you're looking around Dublin and there's not... The guys coming into squads look like they're kind of wing backs, wing forwards. You've seen guys break through. There's, there hasn't really been a, a, a full back or a cornerback come in. And, and they're looking at a guy, Sean McMahon from Rohini. Again, big, strong. And he played a bit of full back. But when I see him, I think of him solo and out with the ball, give and go. And he's more of an early, like, rather than someone who's going to come in and shut someone down, you know. 
Yeah, well, I remember getting on the bus with DKT one day, and we hadn't trained, we'd done nothing. We were going to play our first freshers match. Uh, so I got a sheet of paper and I got them all to write their name down and their club and uh, their position. And I had, as I say, 28 lads on the on the bus. And on when I, the sheet came back up, I had 18 wing backs. <laughs> so, like, it seems to be pretty much in vogue to be a wing back right now. I don't know whether that's that's the easiest position on the field or what, but um, a lot of lads are growing up wanting to be wing backs now. Well, in fairness, you know, nobody wants to grow up wanting to be a cornerback, surely. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you play football to enjoy the game. You don't yeah, no, I, call, I think that's called bad parenting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not a cornerback. <laughs> but, but I mean, there, is there any footballer that Dublin cannot survive the loss of? Um, they've proven in recent years that they like Karen Kilkenny did his crew. You know, again, it was at the start of his career and they managed without him. And um, Brian Fenton's the obvious one, probably because there's no obvious strength and depth in mid- within midfield. You've seen them play James McCarthy midfield in recent years, Keno Sullivan up until his recently as well and um like Brian Howard can come in and play there but 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 Fenton is Fenton is the guy that you would imagine if they lost him that would probably have the biggest impact in how they play the game. He allows them to go long with kick outs. He's just a ridiculously good footballer in all phases of the game. So I think the, the drop from him to probably the next person up is probably the most significant of of any of any gap in the team. Could play in midfield with 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 him with O'Coffee born next grade. Yeah, I don't know if this year will come too soon from. I think they've, they've like he's a huge man, he's a huge young lad, and we, we played him in a club game two years ago, and and he was he fetching ball, and he's well able to shift around the park. So like, good tackler too. Yeah, like I, like he definitely has. You'd imagine he's going to get a even the condensed league this year probably didn't help him. Like if there was six seven league games in a normal year, he probably would have seen more game time, and they would have had a look at him. And um, they gave Tom Lehiff from Jude's a, a bit of game time in the early rounds of Leinster last year. And again, he came in and was solid. And again, he, he'd been very consistent for Jude's and club championships. Um, I wonder will Brian Howard end up maybe this year? Like, I think Howard has to play. He gives them so much. And again, whether Howard ends up coming back to six or, or around midfield. But um, yeah, again, you have the option of James McCarthy if you need to. But I'd say if John Small is missing in the short term, you might see James in the half back line. So um, they might have a look at uh, other guys around the middle. When, when you were in 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 with Dublin and you you kind of span that transi- transition from a Leinster Championship winning team into a, an All Ireland Championship winning team, what was the great difference? Uh, the obvious thing is the standard of player probably continued to improve and the the, the the number of guys that were coming in and um and look there was no doubt there was a mindset change and like all through the 2000s we went from struggling to win Leinster to kind of getting a foothold on Leinster and then we were getting caught on big days like Kerry, Tyrone, Mayo caught us in a couple of, in a couple of years in a row so um but the, the, you could see the guys coming in, Keno Sullivan coming in, Dermot was starting to mature a little bit, Paul Flynn was starting to come in, Bernard was kicking on. So like the, the quality within the squad and the strength and depth within the squad was definitely improving every year. And then in fairness, Pat and Mickey came in and, and probably just put a different focus on things and stripped things back a little bit. And um, it's probably well documented at this stage to kind of... The, in terms of training and we started doing morning sessions, evening sessions, and we went far more defensive. We were very open. We were probably really nice to play against. You'd come out and we'd be, you know, we'd come out and everyone, would, we'd all be trying to play football, like I said, and maybe it was just the, the makeup of the squad and we all came out and, and we were very, when you look back, probably naive in the sense of, but that was probably football at the time. There was far more kicking. There was far more just getting it up into the forwards and winning your own ball. And, we definitely pop, pop more of a defensive structure. Like we were definitely all six backs at hold, even if there was only three or four forwards. You might see like the wing back standing there and there might be nowhere near them, but it was trying to keep that, just making us a little bit more solid and hard to break down. So, and then with that, it just progressed. Um, but again, the quality of guys coming in, Mick McCauley came into the team as well. And like there was every year it felt like there was someone who who was who was bringing the squad on another level. And I think that's, that's ultimately why it, it kind of got to the stage of going from Leinster to all Ireland. Oshin, did you enjoy playing against Mossy's Dublin teams? Yeah, I've gone on record saying I know some of the Dublin boys had a wee bite back of me that uh, that they weren't happy with the fact that I said there was a there was a bit of a soft centre about that uh, Dublin team. Um, they were extremely easy to play against. 
Um, and I also think that, uh, you know, when when we played in that era, we thought we were playing ultimate football. I think when you look back on the, on some of the footage, you realise, <laughs> uh, you know, the analysts were, like, we actually had some of the analysts, but they were analysing games in a completely different way. I mean, the amount of ball that we kicked away was was insane and I think the dubs were exactly the same um but I think yeah I think things changed dramatically and I think that was the the big thing that changed uh that they were much more difficult to play against much more more difficult to figure out and I think they had players then who were just willing to be uh they had just just more bad eggs and I think if you're going to win and you, you need them guys and once they realized that I think then they were able to they were obviously able to move it on to a different level altogether. We we would have like in the probably in those mid two thousands, like we would have talked about tackling and everyone would have tackled. But you're talking earlier about certain responsibilities the forwards had, or and but like Pat came in and Pat and Mickey put such a focus on tackling. It got to the stage I said it to him one day. I was nearly better off letting the cornerback win the ball and tackling him. I get more credit for doing that than actually hitting <laughs> the ball and kicking it over the bar. You know what I'm talking Like that was where that, and it was that's an extreme. But and that was probably what they needed to do at the start to probably change mindsets within guys. Because I like previously you think, oh, well, if I win a ball and kick it over, like that's a positive for the team. But they were that was that was how it felt. It felt like I'm really better off if I get five or six tackles here. I get I get better judge or I get better mark, whatever it might be. And that was definitely um, that's something that they they and it took a while. Like and it, like. The one thing is, like, if you think back, like, 2009 was Pat's first, Pat Mickey's first year, and Kerry gave us an awful trimming in Crow Park. Um, and then in 2010, Mead scored the five goals against us. Like, if we were playing, the draw was probably favourable to us. Philly McMahon cleared the ball off the line against Armagh in a qualifier in Crow Park. There was probably 15,000, 16,000 people. I think we played tip the following week. If we were playing anyone at a probably higher level, we would have been beaten. And Pat and Mickey were probably run out of the job and they'd be a, a, a butt of a joke now, I'd say, at this stage. Philly cleared the ball off the line. I think it was um, Mallon took a shot and it was trickling into the corner and he cleared it. And we, we beat our ma. And then all of a sudden we're, you make to an all in semi-final and you run court close and then you're building on it again. But it was it was so, like it can be so close to going the other way. But And it was probably took that little bit of a run and took us to go that low to realise, look, what we're doing isn't working, so we may as well try something else. Like, if you're not willing to try it, then you're just wasting your time repeating the same thing every year, you know. So, um, were you were, was, you were you surprised that Pat Gilroy was appointed Dublin senior football manager? Uh, yeah, I was. Yeah, sure. I'd say you'd struggle to find anyone in Dublin who said he wasn't. Like, we won a club all Ireland with Pat that uh, March, and so like Pat went from being a teammate. Now he was finishing up playing like he was 36 was he 37 maybe that year so like we won a club all around the march and pat took over the job then the, was it november or whatever month of the year he took over but so he went from player to manager not really having done it at club level no 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 he did yeah exactly he never never did it properly at club level, no. so like there's no doubt it was a surprise um, and the fact jim at the time had won a couple of uh like dublin had won number 21 all ireland and jim was involved in 2003 and he'd been working with some of the, the age grade team so it definitely would have been a surprise uh players anyway at the time i remember hearing it and uh yeah i was surprised by it too. and in that in that turnaround mickey mickey whelan there's a lot talked about the discipline which and the approach the mental approach which pat brought to it but what were mickey whelan's training sessions like um challenging always enjoyable um different uh Mickey's an exceptional coach. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have him with Vincent's. He helped turn Vincent's around as well. So, like, Mickey took over Vincent's probably in 2004, 2005, maybe. And even within our club, like, we hadn't won a club championship in, it was 23 years by the time we won it again in 2007. And, and while as a player, like, you hear stuff about history and stuff like that, like, you can't get caught up in it. You weren't there for the 23 years, but you're aware of it or you're, you're certainly conscious. I was always very conscious. You walk into the club and the photos were getting older year by year. There was no modern pictures up on the wall in the club, so you couldn't help but notice it, you know, and Mickey definitely helped change that. Now, again, he helped, it was an under-21 team in the club that he brought through that won a 21 championship. So, again, you had a crop of guys coming in that he knew he had talent to work with. But, um. Yeah, his training sessions, he pushes people to the limit and a lot of that is trying to find out how you react in terms of 
in a simplistic way, how much do you want it and what are you willing to put up with and what are you willing to give? And but um you rarely have the same session, you'd rarely have um something that you consider repetitive or you'd be going out, going, Oh, geez, we're doing this again, you know. And it was always so from a player's point of view, that's all you want. You want to be challenged. And if you have a group of guys who are who are open to change and open to and like I said, we were in no position to, to turn our noses up at anything. Like we hadn't we hadn't succeeded. We hadn't got we hadn't even got to a final, never mind winning one, you know. So I think within the squad everyone was willing to was willing to listen and, and, and put themselves out there, you know. Well, see, we do this thing every week when there's matches of where we look at the following week's matches and it's uh it's a bit of a it's a bit of a car crash regrettably for some of the for some of the pundits on the show. Um all so, of the, them people aren't here to stand up for themselves. No. Oh <laughs> <laughs> well, they are. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um so uh, last week, uh, Ushin, I have to say, you got six out of seven. Um, what? Did, did really well, but you got Wicklow. You had Wicklow to beat Wexford, and you do have a Wicklow issue. In fairness, you did pick tip Wicklow to beat Mead. No, last no, week. it's not even that. I, I'm not sure. Did I really say that? Yeah, I can't remember. Actually, <laughs> I just made it up. Um, the no, the 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 this week, there's a series of matches on again seven matches. If we run through them. Probably the standout match is Ross Common Galway. What yeah. do you think of that? What do you think of that, Oshin? How do you see that match? Um, I happened to be uh, an RT the day that Ross Common played Kerry and did a lay feed. And I have to say, if I hadn't have seen that game, then I definitely would have been plumping for Galway. But Ross Common were actually very good that day against Kerry. Made life really, really difficult for them. We were able to close down a lot of their, uh, their big names up front. Uh, obviously, I don't know how seriously Kerry were taking the game, but they, I suppose they, they also need a result. But um, Galway, like when when I looked at Galway last week for uh, sorry two weeks ago against Monaghan, I thought to myself, this is a team that has completely changed. Um, they look again just after what we were after talking about. They look a bit harder to play against. Um and uh, obviously I found a couple of players up front, um Tierney in particular. But I just think that uh they're just it's just very difficult to trust Galway at the minute. And uh like as I say, if I hadn't seen that game, I would have said Galway would win this game uh convincingly because like Roscom were really poor against Armagh. They went five one up and Armagh had scored them one sixteen to four points for the remainder of the game. Do you know what I mean? That was after what fifteen? That was up to the water breaks so for seventeen, eighteen minutes. You know that's some hammering. You know from 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 that point of the game. So, um, it's a, it's a, it's a very very difficult one to call. Home advantage might just stand to Roscommon. Uh, maybe them to put to pull off a bit of a shock and, and win that by a point. First shock of the championship, you call it Massey. Yeah, Galway to me look like a team that are still trying to work out what way they're trying to play, who fits where, and um, there was probably great hope and positivity when when poor Joyce went in. In terms of they've obviously been had a couple of tough years before that, so um, but I'm not sure that they're they're where they'd like to be, and um, they've they've been pretty mixed any time I've seen them so far. I watched them that day against Dublin. Dublin looked like they were really out of second gear, and and and. They were only okay, I would say. I think Cook coming back in is a big plus. I don't think he's good around the middle. He's very strong around the middle. But again, I'd give Ross Conlon a great shout this weekend as well. I think, uh, I think Ross Conlon might just, might just pip them. Okay, if we turn to the to the big match in... in Who'd you go for in that one, Paul? So that when we come uh, back... No, we're yeah. counting me as well now. I normally get away with this. Um, I think Galway will win. Um, uh, the big match in Ulster, is Monaghan play for Mana. And in that game, who... Oshin, what do you think? Yeah, I think Monaghan should win that game easy. I think Fermanagh were really lucky to end up where they ended up, like, and they weren't in a, in a in a fight to 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 stave off relegation, which is a dramatic fall for them. Um, don't really seem to be playing with any confidence whatsoever. I think the young lads who have come in probably just haven't had the initial impact that they thought, and probably not going into a a, a setup that's. Um, like I, I think if these guys had a win maybe two, three, four years ago, I think you're talking about a different proposition. 
uh, we, we always think about Fermanagh how difficult they are to beat, and 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 uh, and that was that hasn't been the case. You know, watched them against Down last year. I don't think they've, they've moved on any since that. So, uh, Monaghan, uh, the most resilient team in the country, will go for them to win to comfortably. Massey. Yeah, it's hard to argue with too much of that. I think I expect Monaghan to have far too much of them. And again, it's again uh, we've talked a little bit earlier about the kind of the evolution and the scoring rates, and that's what I'd be interested to see how Monaghan are on that front uh, this weekend. I think it's while well, Fermanagh might get bodies back and might try and make it tough for them. I think it's more a case of let's see what see where Monaghan are at from an attacking perspective. Our man Antrim Uh Yeah. It's, it's uh, yeah, I think Armagh should win the game, should win the game, but I don't think they'll win it maybe as comfortably as what Monon would against against Fermanagh. I think uh, Antrim will make life really tricky for them. And I think one thing that Armagh are struggling with is 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 pace. Uh, teams are running at them with pace. Uh, I think they're very comfortable now and, and the ball is played into the full into the full back line. I think they've sort of sorted that out, but still struggle a little bit with pace between the middle of the field and and uh and getting into the scoring zone. Uh the Murray's a lot off of that. Um you know Walsh, young lad. So I, I think um Arma won the game, just maybe not as comfortably as, as people may think. Yeah, I agree. I agree exactly. That's exactly how I'd see that one as well, Massey. Yeah, and I'm interested to see Armagh have been progressing a bit in the last uh, 18 months or so, and they're, they're certainly on an upward curve. And, and again, staying in Division 1 is a huge, huge bonus for them uh, going forward into next year in terms of the development of the young lads coming through. So, yeah, I expect them to win this. Uh, Antrim are, are improved during the league, but I think it'll be, it'll be too much for them. Uh, Armagh have too much. If we move to the uh, treasure trove that is the Leinster Football Championship, uh, Dublin v Wexford, Oshin, can you call that one? Hmm. Well, Wexford beat my Wicklow, so um, <laughs> I think the Dubs, the Dubs will win this. I just again, I'll be looking at what the Dubs put up um, and what the Dubs can get out of the game. Uh, I think the Wexford result, to be fair to them last week, is a massive result for them considering where they finished up um, league-wise. So I think you know they probably have got as much as they could get, you know, out of the championship. Uh, and unfortunately for them, no backdoor system. Uh, and as I say, that's that's to win that game was was serious progress when you consider what's going on in the last twelve months. But Dublin by twenty plus. Massey. I, I enjoyed um, Shane Roach, the Wexford manager, said in his interview. He he went full on manager mode and said, "We give Dublin the, the due respect they deserve." I think with his line, you know. So <laughs> I think he was. Uh, I did enjoy that. Um, yeah, He's done a great job, on, hasn't he, to recover no, no, from, no, absolutely. from the league. Yeah, yeah no, no doubt. And, and you could see what it meant to some of them last week. Like, it was the first championship win in is it seven or eight years now at this stage. So like, it, it, there's no doubt it was, a, it was a big win from last week. And there's a lot of good work being done down in Wexford at the moment um, in terms of structurally and what they're putting together from a, from a county board perspective. So it's an area they'll obviously be putting folks on to try and keep developing. But for the game itself this weekend, I'm intrigued to see um, Dublin forward unit in terms of Dean Rock has been carrying an injury. I think he's relatively close to coming back. But what they do, Corma Coslo, I think, has done enough from open play to, to merit a start, irrespective of whether he's on freeze or not. So if Dean is back or so I'm interested to see how Cormac progresses. He, he's had a clear run of injuries during the league. He's been he's been playing every game. And I just think when you're looking for that kind of X factor with Mannion gone and kind of Dermot gone in the last couple of years, I think Cormac is Cormac is, is the potential to deliver that. So that's, a, that's an that's an interesting one because like not a lot of people have said that, you know about the two of them playing. Do you think the two of them can play? I definitely think the two of them can play. Yeah, I, I don't think it has to be either or. Like as in, if I think if Dean's fit, Dean plays. Um, I think his his free taking's at a level. And, and Does Paddy Small go so? Yeah, well, well, this is what I'm interested to see. Like Paddy Small, I think has played a couple of league games at wing forward now, and I know Sean Bugler played most of the championship at wing forward last year. And again, where does Brian Howard fit in? Like obviously Scully and Kilkenny and Connell play. So you're kind of looking at seeing where where the 
if Dean's not fit this weekend, it probably makes it easier for them to maybe start Cormac and Cormac stays on the freeze. But I do think when it comes to the business end, if Dean's fit, Dean will play. But I, I definitely think the two of them can play in the same and forward line. I don't think Cormac's not a player. I talked to her earlier, but sometimes as a free taker, it sometimes helps to take freeze. But I think Cormac has definitely has enough to offer from play that even if Dean's there and is on freeze, Cormac absolutely merits a start. I think it, I think is um he's a little bit similar to like I, enjoy, I love watching forwards who, when they get the ball, their intent is goal. Like, I love watching Conor Callahan. He's just a machine when he gets the ball. His first thought is always goal. Cormac's a little bit similar. There's other guys who get the ball and they're happy enough to clip a point or whatever it might be. So I think Cormac, I think Cormac gives them that intent as well inside. Um, so I'm intrigued, I'm intrigued to see. You mightn't see it this weekend if Dean's not fully back. But as, as one of the things you'll see in Leinster is because last year when Dublin did get up and running, the team didn't really change. Like they started with Bugler at wing forward and Paddy Small corner forward in most games, and uh, so it felt like once they kind of got in, it got into the team. That was nearly the team. That might be the case this year, but uh, yeah, the makeup of the forward line, I'd be, I'd be keeping an eye out on. You can sleep easy. You can sleep easy in eight, Paul. There's one or two options there for the Dubs. Yeah, it just seemed like that. All right, as <laughs> we're going through the names, I was actually thinking that. So Sean Bugler, I see a little bit of Sean Bugler in Plunkett's where uh, where my kids play and. Mm. Um, he's a really, really, he's a really good footballer. But it struck me the way he was used by Dublin last year as a half forward. He was almost used to take the ball out of the backs and truck it up to the half forward line and then shift it on. I'm not sure I see Paddy Small doing that job for Dublin. I think I, I, I no. think much more of an inside man. Yeah, he is, and that's why I'd say they're probably having a look at one or two things in the league and seeing, well, if we do play Paddy at 10 or 12, can he do that? And, and to be honest, there'll be some, like Sean as an underage player would have been more of a scorer as well. Yeah. Sean, Sean's very, like, he's a high skill set, he's right foot, left foot. And there's times in games last year, and sometimes when you come into the squad, and, and I'd say it's a testament to him, he was laying the ball off. There was one or two times where I actually thought he could have taken a point or two. And you think back to the when Dermot or Paul Flynn and they'd come out with four or five points and wing forward or whatever it might be. Sean's probably getting one or two. And I think that'll come naturally for him. He has that that ability to, to, to add scoring to, to what he's doing. But he, he played a very selfless role last year, similar to Niall Scully. But yeah, I, I, Paddy Small for me is an inside forward as well. Um, I'd like to see Paddy being a bit more direct. Paddy likes to stand guys up. He likes to take that yeah. solo stand and nearly trying to draw a defender in. I don't think he needs to do that. With the pace he has, he could just go and guys are going to struggle to stay with him. I don't think he needs, because different guys need to, to, to set a defender up. I think Paddy has the, has the pace to just go. It doesn't, doesn't need to rely on that all the time. So, um, But yeah, there's a few options there that they'll, that they'll see what, what, what works best for them. Kildare v. Offaly uh, on Sunday in, in Port Leash. Dar O'Shea was writing about Jack O'Connor uh, this week and he, the Kildare manager. And he wrote about how <laughs> Jack never picks a team, never really gets involved in a team that doesn't have a chance of winning and stuff. So he smells it out, is basically what Dara was saying. So he smelled out the fact that Kerry, 2003, 2004, you know, there's a real, real team there. He did the same in school teams, went back into the Kerry minors, then the Kerry 20s and all that. So the sense that he was saying was that Jack is, 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 is a good man for timing on a team that can arrive. Oshin, is Kildare, have Kildare arrived or are they arriving? Um, well, they've, they've been better, I think, this year. I think this is a we've, we've seen sig sig uh, significant uh, change in them as far as their approach. I think we've seen a significant change as far as the performance levels. Uh, I think they have they obviously have been hurt by injuries in the last couple of years, but I think uh, those injuries a lot of those injuries are cleared up and they have a um, significant personnel back as well. Um, but it's hard to see them, you know, it's hard to see them doing some doing anything this year that uh, is going to make people sit up and take notice. I, I think that Awfully have a great chance this weekend, and the reason why I think they have a great chance is that uh, they have momentum behind them. They've, they've obviously, I think, you know, looking at the game last week, and I hope my uh, loud in laws will forgive me for this, but. I personally wanted to see Awfully win last week because of the fact that they went and they played that league final um, and uh, showed a lot of intent. Uh, started to think outside the box a little bit, uh, took a chance. They, were, they weren't great last week, let, let's face it. You know, they weren't. In fact, they weren't great at all last week, but still managed to win the game. So, uh, Awfully and Kildare, like, 
how much do Offaly and Kildare people? What's our, what's that rivalry? How ba- real is that rivalry, Paul? And oh, it's I real! Think, yeah, it's real. If you go along that border from Eden Derry across to Rathang and Clumbalogue, it's raw. Yeah, so I think that gives I think that gives Offaly uh, some sort of chance. Um, but as far as taming with Kildare is concerned, I don't see them winning anything. Who are you predicting? I have to play golf at McNamee in a couple of weeks. Um, kill there. Thank God. Um, Marcy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going with kill there as well. I, I don't know how Oshin's after talking about Boffley there for the last two minutes. I think <laughs> no, that was something else, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, to be honest, I haven't seen a huge amount of Kildare. I saw them in one of their first league games. Um, I saw bits of them against Mead there the last day, and it, it was tight enough for them to come through that one. But I just think it'll be a bit of a step up for Offaly. Like, it was great for Offaly to win last week, but it took them, obviously, it wasn't their best performance. And even the goal they got to, towards the end of the game was, was fortunate enough. Um, I'm sure he'll say he was going for it, but... Um, it he was, wasn't. Uh, no, Not he definitely chance. wasn't. No, he wasn't. But uh, it was... Um, yeah, I think it'll be a bit too much, and you'd imagine uh, again some of the personnel that have come back for Kildare. I just think it'll be. I think they'll win. Yeah, yeah, I think Offaly will win if if certain key players for Offaly perform the way they can perform, and if Offaly play with a lot of pace and they move the ball quickly and they go at Kildare from the start and they just play with the kind of aggression and spirit that the minor footballers played with last night against Mead, which agreed fell up fell short by. Uh, by a point but I think it's time for that group of Offaly footballers to actually win a serious Leinster football match and I think it might be Sunday particularly if Shane Lowry wins the golf and there's an Offaly double on. Uh, uh, that's seven ifs that's seven, that's seven ifs well you made a case for them and then, <laughs> then then went for Kildare you didn't even have an if um, if, if Larry wins the golf and awfully beat Kildare myself and Ocean will be down to you for Sunday evening so we'll, well, well that'll be a big evening lads that'll be a big <laughs> evening Esco Hills for 18 holes <laughs> um, Leash v Westmead in uh, in the Maracanã and Tullamore who's who's winning that Ocean? Uh Westmead I actually think Westmead didn't get what they probably deserve from the league uh, some of the performances were, were uh, excellent, I thought. Um, Leash seemed to have fallen in a hole. Uh, and in particular, their last game uh, against Down, 219 to 212. How they conceded 219 against Down, from what I seen at the weekend, you know, uh, you know that, that it doesn't make good reading. Just think they've really struggled this year. Again, zero confidence. And as a result of the league performances, that seemed to have dipped even more. Westmead, yes, didn't pick up any wins, but I've seen enough from Westmead to think that they'll win this game. I agree with that. Massey? Yeah, very much so. And it, to me, the biggest problem for Leash is up front. They're just not scoring at all. They're, and even the 2-12, I think, is the biggest score they put up this year. Yeah. And even that, I think they've been... Um, I read. I was listening. I like listening to Mike Quirk. I think Mike's Mike's an interesting guy, and he comes across as a as someone who knows what he's doing. And I just I saw him. I think he was, there was a quote about how their their kick out percentage is up, their shot selection is up, and like he's talking about the little things you've got to do and hope that a performance comes in the back of it. But they're just really struggling in front of goal, and um, it's very hard to see them putting up a big enough score to win this game. And Westmead, although like what she said, they did a poor performance early on the league, did a good performance against Cork in that semi final, and I think I think they'll be much better place to put up a score that's going to win this game. The one caveat I'll put into that is that if Donny Kingston is playing and causes wreck in a full forward line, as he can do, that's mm. the that's the only that's the only X factor in 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 that game as I see it. Mead v Longford Ushin. Uh, I'm not going against Mead again this year, that's for sure. Um uh, that come back to bite me. Again, uh, interesting in Park Por- Davis's comments, you know, around the league and, and what the expectation is and the fact that they are <coughs> where they are and that's where they belong. And uh, I watched me V down this year and I thought uh, Jordan Morris was excellent for them. Um, and Cal Hickey, two young lads, uh, Cal Hickey's playing defence. Uh, I think Mead's recurring problem is, is the keeper. Uh, and uh, they continued even just I suppose 
if you're a key, if if I was looking for a mead keeper, I think they've gone through twelve in the last what four or five years. And if I was looking for a mead keeper, I'd just be looking for a keeper. I'd just be looking for somebody who's just really solid. The back kickouts are good. But they had they took their keeper Andrew Colgan up to take uh, take forty fives. He kicked one out of five and just continued with it. And and uh, and I think you know that the, you can see the confidence just sort of ebbing away from him. So. I think you know that's the one position that they just cannot solve at the minute. So, uh, but I'll go for me to win this game. I think they they have, they have plenty up front, plenty up front. They should win it comfortably. I I really admire Longford, how they approach things, how they squeeze the most out, yeah. of, out of what they have. They're a solid Division Three team. I think Park Davis has done an outstanding job with them. I think it was really admirable. Actually, really honest what he said about yeah. you know where they where 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 they are, and I think that they will give me the serious going. But I do I think Mead will will win that as well. Mossy, do you think Mead will win, and do you miss the real Mead Dublin rivalry? Yeah, I think I do think Mead will win. Um, there's probably a bit of pressure on them to deliver. Like there are, there's obviously been a bit of goings on in the background down there between the under twenty management and the senior management, and. Um, for they're probably at a, I know they won the minor uh, during the week there, but they're at a stage where they need to start. I suppose, and they are looking at it in terms of their structures and what they're trying to do. But they really need to start pushing on. And I just saw I saw some of their game against Mayo, and they made a load of changes to that game. They gave five or six guy, guys different a bit of game time, and you're looking at that saying. I would have liked to have seen them. Like I spoke about Kerry going at hard after every game in the league, and you can't. I don't think you've games to waste. I don't think they can say, "Well, look, let's change out half our team here, and like we'll take this week off." And that to me kind of made. Now I know they'll say, "Look, they could have X amount of injuries and everything else," but that's that's what it felt like. And certainly the performance they delivered that day. That game was over after 15 minutes, you know. So, um, that would kind of from a from a preparation point of view, you'd be looking at it going, "That's not ideal." And obviously, Kildare beat them the last day. So I do think there's a bit of pressure on them to perform this weekend. I, I agree. I think that they have a bit of class up front and some of the young guys coming through. But um, as for missing the rivalry, you do, yeah. Like, you, you, like there's no doubt. Like, well, I grew up during the 90s going to Crow Park and those Dublin Mead games were just, they were epic. And then even when we played them a number of times in the 2000s, it was always touch and go. And um, yeah, like, it's, it, I think it's inbuilt in Mead. Although then you get into Crow Park and Dublin score a goal and you're like, oh, yeah, no, I'm delighted they're beating Mead. You know, I think that's just, you're just, <laughs> I'm scarred enough from, from, I'm old enough to remember those games. There might be younger guys who don't have that, that feeling, but it was, um, yeah, no, like I think there's no doubt it'd be better in terms of from a, all you want to see is competitive football, competitive games. And I'm not, no more talking about Kildare. Like Kildare, Kildare and Mead, like cons- consistently now at underage level are beating Dublin teams at minor and 20s. So there's an onus on them to make sure that these guys are coming in and they're going into an environment where they're going to improve and they're going to push on. And um, I think that's the challenge for both of those counties in particular. And that's where we'll leave it. Uh, thank you to Larry Ryan for running this podcast, to Tony Lean, to to uh, Renault and to everyone at Examiner Sport for making that happen. Huge thanks to, to Ushin and especially to, to Massey. We'll be back soon. With Renault, passion for what drives you. Official car partner of the GAA. And a, a grain of rice. And a, a grain of rice. It's going to tip the scale. Just remember that. Then. And a small bit of a needle there. Come on, Mayo, you've got to get Andy Moran into the game. Listen, Victorian.